guys, Kevin Bupp here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. Now, our guest for this week's show is real estate and land investment expert, Mark Podolsky. Now, Mark is the owner of Frontier Properties, a very reputable and successful land investing company, and has been buying and selling land full time since 2001. Now, Mark has since completed over 6,000 land deals with an average ROI of over 300% on cash flips and over 1,000% on deals he sells on seller carry terms. Additionally, Mark is a published author and host of the successful podcast titled The Art of Passive Income. And so, guys, without further ado, I'd like to welcome back, I think for the third or fourth time, <laughs> my friend Mark Podolsky. Mark, how you doing, my friend? Kevin, great, great, to, great to be here. Great to see you again, brother. Yeah. Yeah, it's my like third, fourth time. I know it's been a number of times that we've been on each other's shows. It's uh, it's been many, many years since we first met. So looking forward to having you back here. And just uh, it's always good to get an update, right? I look back. I think the last time I had you on was, it was two years ago. I think we were probably still in the heat of uh, of COVID. You know, um, yeah, we we knew that the world wasn't ending, but still things weren't normal. You know, uh, I know that you're you're out in Arizona, I believe. I'm in Florida, and so it was probably more normal for us maybe than um than than some other folks, uh, depending on where you lived at that time. But anyway. Just wanted to bring you back on, bud, and um, and just you know learn again for maybe for those folks that that um, you know that that don't know of who you are, maybe they haven't listened to one of the other interviews I've done or haven't heard you in other shows. Maybe give a little bit of a background on yourself, but also just get an update as to what's going on in the land investing business, uh, how your business is going today. You know, lots of lots of different changes in the marketplace. You know, interest interest rate fluctuations. Or I shouldn't say fluctuations. This increases. No decreases. Yeah, they haven't come back down. So um, that's having a lot of impact uh, in the real estate world in general. But um, you know, would love to dive in, dive deep into you know what that looks like in your world. But uh, before we go there, Mark, take a few minutes if you would. Um, again, for those that aren't familiar with you, your background, and what it is you do, tell us a little more about yourself. Yeah, yeah. So basically, I just have one simple mission in life, which is help people not solve not just their money problems, but their time problems. And so. You also have the same mission, but the way I like to do it is through raw, undeveloped land. So what we do is we acquire the property, 25, 30 cents a dollar, we'll flip it, and then we'll owner finance it. And so we'll create a note on that land and we'll have passive income. So we get this one-time sale, we get recurring passive income every single month, but Kevin, no renters, no rehabs, no renovations, no rodents, and because we're not dealing with the tenant, we're exempt from Dodd Frank, Respa, mm -hmm. and the Safe Act. All this owners' real estate leg legislation. So it's just a simple game we play. Can we create enough land notes where our passive income exceeds our fixed expenses, and then we're working because we want to, not because we have to. And because these are smaller deals, this is sort of the gateway drug to doing doing larger deals, say into mobile home parks or parking mm -hmm. lots. Awesome. Awesome. Good deal. I appreciate the high level overview and um, just a, a couple pointed questions to give the listeners a better understanding of the business model. So raw undeveloped land, uh, what does that look like? The general size of, of these pieces of land that you might be acquiring and then, you know, general location, are these uh, in densely populated areas or these uh, out in rural locations? Yeah. So location is we definitely want to be an hour to three hours outside the nearest city. So they're going to be more rural mm -hmm. because let's face it, if I, you know, make an offer for a Tampa Bay infill lot. I'm not getting it 25, 30 cents a dollar. They'll go to the biggest, baddest land broker in town and they'll sell that for 110 cents on the dollar. So I'm not getting a good deal on on that necessarily. We're not have to send out so much, so many offers that um, it's like finding a needle in the haystack. Mm -hmm. So I want to go to these more, what I call inefficient markets where nobody really knows the value of the raw land. It's what a buyer and a seller agree to. And so that's that's really where we want to focus is on inefficient markets. It's rural land. And we want to focus on the sunshine states, Florida, Arizona, Nevada, California, uh, Texas, Colorado, New Mexico, Nev uh, you know, a little bit in the Northwest, Washington, uh, and, uh, you know, so so those areas there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, for sure. And, like, and, and, and I'll do, I'll do deals in the Midwest as well, mm -hmm. but I'm going to avoid areas in like the Northeast where I could have to deal with super fun sites. Um, you know, areas in the Midwest where no, it, it's, I'm not going to have a big buyer market. Like nobody 
think to themselves, boy, I'd like some raw land in Minnesota today, unless you live in Minnesota. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I want to be in the sunshine states uh, for sure. Okay, fantastic. And what is the typical end use for the folks that buy these these uh, raw, undeveloped tracts of land from you? I guess when I say tracts, I guess what general size are we talking? Uh, yeah, yeah. So everything talking... from a postage stamp to 640 acres, okay. uh, a full section. So, you know, I, I'm really kind of not, not in my buy box. Like, I really don't care the size. I'm I'm really focused on making my money on the buy because what I found through all these years is that at the right price, they all sell. So I've never been stuck with a piece of raw land. So I don't need to focus on you know a certain size. I would say if I could just pick my favorite size, it would be forty acres. But you know the, the market that? doesn't let me pick. Uh, forty acres. There's something special I think about that size of land. Um, when I've sold them in the past, they they have a, a great margin. They sell really quickly, and it, there's just, I don't know, you know, why buyers like 40 acres more than say one acre or five acres or 10 acres or, you know, 120 acres. It just, it, it's, it's yeah. affordable and it's, it's big. It's, 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 it's yeah, a big it's big. Size. And maybe it's because, you know, from one side to the other, you can't see the other. It's big enough to where it feels like you literally have, you, you own maybe your own you know, miniature forest or depending on what type of land it is, right? Because you can't see yeah. from one side or the other if there's trees and things like that. Whereas five acres, you can see the other parcel line on the other side. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. The typical end buyer, you know, maybe may, may speak to the, uh, the, the the individuals that would be buying or attracted to that 40 acre tract of land. You know, what, what are they typically buying it for? And what's the end uses? Uh, and I know it probably runs the gamut, but just... Mm -hmm. If you had to pick the uh, the top two uses of, of what they end up doing with that land, what is it? Yeah, I'd say the top two uses are recreationally. They want to use it. They want to go out there and do whatever they want on the property. So we're looking for property that has no restrictions. Mm -hmm. So if they want to camp, they want to hunt, they want to uh, improve the land some way, they can do it. Oftentimes, it will have legacy investors. So one day, they're going to do something out there. But they like the idea, like, I have an asset. I don't have to maintain. I don't have to protect. No one can steal it from me. And it's, it, you know, keeps going up in value, especially with inflation. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are sort of the, the two avatars that we're looking for. So somebody that, you know, wants to take their family out there and, you know, there's no cell service. Hey, we're going to unplug. Yeah. Uh, we also got a lot of military people as well who are more equipped to say, be like more like a, a prepper, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, the people who don't like people, they like this land as well. You would made a mention in the beginning um, that one of the opportunities in the space is that a lot of folks that own these raw tracts of land that are, you know, two, three hours outside of a, a, a dense population, they might not even, you know, there's not a lot of great comps. Um, it, it's, right. it's hard to really put a value on it. You can't just go on realtor.com and find, you know, a bunch of other tracks that have sold historically in the, in the last 12 months to, to really get a general sense of what the, you know, the land might be valued at per acre. And so I guess what, on that same uh, on that same line of thought, how do you guys go about finding or determining what that value might be or what that land might be worth? Yeah, such a good question. So what we'll do is we will take a look at the comp the comps for the last twelve to eighteen months, and there might not be many; they might be all over the place. So we're just going to take the lowest comp and divide by four, and that would get us what Warren Buffett would call a three hundred percent margin of safety, and then we'll send an actual offer for that property. So I don't want to be like the house guys and say, Hey, I'm interested in buying your land. Like, Hey, great. And now I'm in the appraisal business. Mm -hmm. So I can always make more money. I can't get more time. So I really want to go after the lowest hanging fruit uh, with my offers. Okay. Of all those, all you sent out a hundred offers or what's the ratio of, of, of landing a deal? Is it a hundred offers to, to one, you know, closed deal or is it greater? Than yeah, that? that's exactly it. So I'm, I'm looking at a three to 5% response rate. So I know my pricing is 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 in the right ballpark because mm -hmm. if it's under 3%, I'm coming in too low. But if it's over 5%, I'm probably coming in too high. So that's my big metric. And then my closing ratio after doing my research or due diligence, I can probably buy about 1% of those. Sometimes, you know, there's there's the the back taxes are too high mm -hmm. or they counter 
and they want too much money. Uh, you know, something might come up where there's there's some issue with you know access or um, you know maybe the num- the neighbors dumping, mm-hmm. and there's a bunch of tires. It's going to cost thousands of dollars to clean up. So, of of you know the three to five I, I can look at for every hundred offers I I I send out, I can buy about one. Got it. Of those ones, you know, using the example, I guess, of like you know, someone dumping tires and and uh, you know maybe having waste there that's going to create maybe some environmental challenges, maybe uh, deem yeah. it to be a not 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 attractive site for you to acquire. How do you? I'm sure you're not going to all these remote places to run due diligence on these properties. No, right? no, yeah, we'll have to... someone local go okay. out there. So for about fifty bucks, we'll put out a local ad, hire someone to go out there, take pictures, shoot video fill out our property report. We'll double check. We'll have them download an app called what three words. So we get their GPS coordinates and we can sort of uh, match it to where it is. So, it's, you know, sometimes they're not exactly there, but they're close enough. What three words. That's what that's the, the app's called. Yeah. What three okay. words.com. What yeah. three words. Guys, I'll put that in the show notes. Very interesting. Cause a lot of times when we're going to buy a mobile home park, uh, if we're if we're looking if we're, if we have an opportunity to come across our desk, you know, you can do Google Earth, um, you can do Street View, depending on what it is, and get a general sense of what's there. But it still doesn't it doesn't give you the, the you know the same uh, warm and fuzzy as as visiting it you know uh, in person, being on site, putting boots on the ground. However, just like you, we're not going to be hopping on flights um, in a pre- preliminary sense, but like way before we've even uh, um, you know at least with us like before we've truly agreed on price or or even spent money on legal contracts and things like that we want to we want to get an idea of what it really looks like how much road work we want to put in tree work things like that so normally what we'll do is we'll go on um, uh, Craigslist in the gig section and we'll put a we'll, you know we'll we'll put a gig up there in a couple different areas all for somebody anywhere between 50 and 100 bucks to go out and everyone's got a smartphone now everyone's got yeah. the, everyone's got everyone's got a really high end camera um even the cheapest smartphones are you know better than the cameras that were out uh, you know 5 years ago right so everyone's got the ability to take you know high resolution photographs and videos and so we typically do a very similar thing is that what you guys use to find those it's, it's, it's those exactly what we do okay. yeah that's exactly yeah. what we do Craigslist gig and, you know, today we don't have to send a check, right? You, right. you know, yeah. now you can just, hey, once you're out there and the job's done and you filled out this property report, we can go ahead and sell you or Venmo you or PayPal you. It's great. Can you typically talk these sellers into carrying back financing or are you buying these outright and then you turn around offering financing? Or can you create like an arbitrage as well? There? We, um, we can do both. We can do an arbitrage. I say we prefer, though, just to make it simple mm-hmm. and and usually when there's an arbitrage play, it's within my own community because they kind of understand what's going on as opposed to a, an emotional seller who who wants their money. They'll, they'll typically they want cash. So we pay cash, I would say, the majority of the time. But let's say that um, I've got a piece of property, right, that I've, I bought and I say I paid $10,000 for it. And uh, I sell it for $2,000 down, 500 bucks a month. And a year goes by and sure enough, they default, right? So now they've lowered my cost basis. And now my, you know, my my cost basis is $2,000 on a $10,000 piece of property. So I might flip that wholesale to someone in my community that I, that I know can then sell at retail. And so if I know the market is $500 down, $500 a month or $2,000 down, Five hundred dollars a month. I might say, "Hey, put a thousand dollars down. Do two fifty a month." And so they'll flip it for two thousand down, five hundred a month, and they'll make the spread, and they're mitigating their their risk on that. Mm-hmm. So they just come up with the whole ten thousand. They can control the land essentially. Got it. Got it. Have there ever been a has there ever been a track of land um, that that you've gotten a response on that you've had the ability to buy that has just been an unbelievable not not from a profitability standpoint but just like a a unique piece of property. Maybe it's got a view, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's a view of the mountains. Maybe it's, uh, you know, it sits on a river. Maybe it's a view of the ocean. I don't know. Something very unique and attractive that you decided that you, you just need to keep it for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I have, I have a few of trophies through the years that, you know, they, they go into uh, my land trust and, you know, for estate planning, state purposes, uh, my kids know, Hey, don't sell this land until, you know, you're, you're going to get pick, pick yeah. one. What was unique about it? Not just that you got it at a discount, but what was unique about it? Well, for, for me, you, usually 
the, I'd say the majority of them aren't going to be what I would call like trophy properties where it's, it's on a lake or on the side of a mountain or like something like absolutely beautiful. They're in the path of growth. When we start doing our due diligence, I'm like, Oh yeah. wait, we're not, we're not selling this. Like let's wait for the developer. Yeah. So, so it's, a, it's yeah. a hold and wait. We know it's coming. Like it's not, we know oh, it's coming. Come. Yeah. We know it's coming. Yeah. It and, and that's not my model, years. right? Like I'm not a land banker. Uh, you know, that's a hockey stick model where you wait, you wait, it's got negative cash flow, And then all of a sudden it hockey sticks up with the development. So I, I don't like it. Uh, but when we find it, we'll hold it. Yeah. What yeah. do the uh, the terms look like on the selling side nowadays? Uh, you know, what type of spread do you guys like that? Is, do you base it on prime? Is that like prime plus, um, so for plus? I mean, and how do you come up with the the selling terms of the, of the yeah? Loan? So so the selling terms is typically for every thousand dollars we've invested, we want to get a hundred dollars a month uh, from a term. Uh, is, is typically the way we, we're we're looking at it. So okay. we, we're looking at how quickly can we get our, you know, the capital recovery ratio. How how quickly can we get our money back out? on that deal. Plus we have the down payment. We would charge a no collection fee, but as far as the what interest does that rates normally concerned, equate to, yeah. Like from an interest rate perspective, like what, what yeah, from an interest rate to? perspective, I mean, you know, we'll, we'll look at it like, because we're making, we have, we have such an inefficient market. We're, we're making such a high yield that we're going to use the interest rate. It's not going to be like a big profit piece for us. Mm -hmm. Right. Where you know, like think about a bank, like they're making their money on the interest. Well, we're more like, say, a car dealer. Like, how does how come the car dealer Buy can give beer. you two percent? Yeah. You know, so we're we're using it more as as a marketing tactic than than actually a, a piece of the profit. Um, your your yeah. your 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 buyers are probably typically more buying on their monthly payment. The budget can they afford exactly. their monthly payment than than that of uh you know how long that term might go or like it's literally yeah what, yeah. I've got a thousand dollars a month of discretionary income. I'd like to allocate four hundred dollars of that to go buy a piece of investment property. Well, this piece that Mark is selling it's three hundred eighty bucks a month. I don't even care what the price is really. You know, it's just I can afford the three hundred eighty bucks a month. Yeah 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 exa exactly. And so. Yeah. You know, we'll use it as a lever and say, hey, look, you know, the interest rate on this is 10%. But if you can put this much down, so we get our money out of the down payment, we'll we'll lower it. We'll, we'll do 0%. Can you do that? Does that sound, you know, fair? And so oftentimes they'll do that. So we use it more for a marketing technique sure. and, and sales technique than anything else. So you went through you 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 have been doing this quite some time. Um, you went through you know I guess the so softening real estate market and just you know this challenging job market. You know, uh, two thousand seven eight and then you know many years there beyond that. Um, obviously you know unemployment's creeping up a little bit now and and you know I think there's a little bit of uh, stress um, throughout you know throughout the consumer marketplace. And so I guess you know given that a lot of these are kind of second properties for folks, you know it's a it's an investment or it's a recreational piece of property. Um, you know, are you finding that as the economy gets more challenging, that the default rate goes up? Uh, with Absolutely. Model? Yeah. I mean, when I, you know, in the great recession, my default rate was 50%. 50? And so I, yeah. So I even wrote, I wrote about it in Dirt Rich uh, because I had Parkinson's law of money. So the more money I made, the more money I spent and the company was profitable, but I had built such a high overhead for myself that to take that kind of hit for me personally, uh, and my income was terrible. So now we use profit first and uh, just make sure that we we put aside money and, and know that. But I think the probability of having another great recession is in my lifetime is is probably pretty low, but there's going to be a, a tough recession. And so I would budget when I'm looking at my note portfolio that, yeah, there could be a 20% default rate if we start seeing higher unemployment. And I don't really mind because I've got no debt. So interest rates can do whatever they want to do. And then if the person defaults, well, they've lowered my cost basis. And now I have a new a new way to rebalance that portfolio with the new pricing given the economic conditions. Got it. What what are the, you know, for someone that's just getting started in this in this business model, um, right now, obviously you're you're a well seasoned uh, business professional. Your business has been around quite some time. You've got the available cash, access to the available cash to buy these 
to buy these land deals when they come along, when they fit your, your buying box. Um, but for, for someone that's, you know, got, you know, five, 10,000 bucks, you know, they got the wherewithal to at least get some mailers out and, 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 and get the business off the ground and get some leads coming in, but, you know, might be tapped out fairly quickly. They, you know, they spend their first 10,000 or, or eight of that 10,000 on buying that first piece of property, sell it on terms, you know, great that they're making a, a you know, a solid return on their investment, but they're out, they're out of a, a chunk of cash and uh, it's going to take quite some time for them to save up enough to buy the next one. And so is, are there, are there financing options? Are there hard money options out there um, that, mm -hmm. that can help fund these types yeah, of Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, we're making our money on the buy. So there's always money out there for that. But let's say that you're really new and you don't want to go to Uncle Kevin and ask him for money on this deal. So, but you've got, say, $50,000 on a note that you've sold or $100,000 of note portfolio. But to your point, you're out of cash now because it's going to take some time to get your capital out. Well, you can go to Uncle Mark and say, hey, I want to sell you this note and I'll buy it 50 cents on the dollar. So you're going to make profit and you're going to get your cash out. Now you can go do that again. And so it's almost like a wholesale deal as opposed to a retail deal. You're not going to make as much, but you're still going to make a great return. You get your capital back out and can do it again and you can build up your cash that way. If that's if you don't want to go out and and find, you know, there's there's no shortage of people that will give you money on an equity deal or debt deal. Depends on how you structure it. Depends on how sophisticated you are. Uh, I personally don't like equity deals, but um, yeah. people do it all the time because they don't they don't like the idea of debt. How long would that deal or that note have to season before Uncle Mark would have an interest in buying it? Well, Uncle Mark's in the land business, so it doesn't have to be seasoned at all. Okay. Um, I think, you know, for other people, like Uncle Kevin would want a really seasoned note, and he'd want some, because you're not in the day-to-day -day business of buying and selling raw land, right? Like, if, if like I would buy the paper on your mobile home park tomorrow, if but if I'm not in that business, then I'd want some type of guarantee, like if that, that park owner defaults, then will Uncle Kevin go ahead and make me whole and resell it? Sure. Like that that's something that we would do. Understood. Understood. What else? What ha what haven't I asked you that it, that you feel is uh of relevance and importance for folks that again have never heard about this business or maybe a little bit about, but don't fully understand it, just um uh, uh, from a general sense. Is there a anything I mean, else you'd like to share? I, I'm always skeptical. I think people are skeptical. Like, you know, Mark, if it's so great, why are you telling everybody about it? And I think it's a fair question, right? Um, because we're, we know we're, we're teaching this model to people. And the reason that I'm teaching this is that I can. We have a massive market. There's billions of acres of raw land available in the United States. And you couldn't think of a more boring real estate niche. You, me, a million people could be in this niche. We'll all run out of money before we run out of deal flow. And because we're doing smaller deals, you're not going to have to compete with private equity or hedge funds. So it's, you know, having too much money in this niche is actually a problem. So we're, we're in this sort of this, this massive market. It's, a, it's, it's sort of a Goldilocks market where too low of money is a problem, too much money is a problem. And for me, there's nothing more that's been professionally gratifying than when someone tells me, hey, Mark, thanks for sharing this. Because now I was able to quit the job I hated. Uh, I'm retired. I've I've solved my money problems. I've solved my time problems, and now I'm able to really live my best life and, and really figure out my true purposes in life. Where most people are just grinding, and you know, they're just way they're living for Friday, and Sunday comes around, and they get the Sunday blues, and they got to be back at work on Monday because I've lived it. And so for me to be that pebble in the pond and have that impact and have it ripple out and affect every, every area of someone's life is, yeah. has been really gratifying. That's awesome. I, I interviewed a guy um, a while back, maybe not a while back, in the last year, and uh, similar model. However, his his kind of niche was uh, was acquiring, you know, I think 20 to 40 acre tracts of land and then uh, doing um, – 
subdividing it uh but but it was an and i don't know the terminology it was in areas where basically it was very easy like within like within filing a couple documents within the county you could, yeah you could, yeah you could that, you could create, you could split great, the parcels great model it's a great model so he would yeah i mean basically he would you know uh um you know buy one parcel uh, you know 20 acre parcel subdivide it into you know four or five acre parcels and then those five acre parcels will carry a much higher premium than that of uh what that that acreage would be worth as the entire whole and so um, is that something that you, that you practice or that you absolutely. That, that, okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's how I got started really. Um, I made $5 million in one deal, uh, in Nevada. So I, so there's, um, it's a long story, but basically the railroad owned all these 640 acre parcels and Morgan Stanley came in and bought it all off from the railroad. And then Morgan Stanley went to another public company and sold it off to them because they wanted the middle rights on all this land. So I went to that company and said, Hey, give, you know, give me your, the parcels that, you know, have no value to you. And I'll buy them, you know, 30 bucks an acre, like 30 bucks an acre for properties that we know have no mineral rights. I'm like, yeah. So I did it and I started selling. So then I subdivided those. And again, it was just a few, you know, hire a local surveyor goes through, he plats it. That's it. Right. It wasn't really anything more complicated than that. So now I've got uh, 1440s and 180 by these county regulations. And I was selling those 40s for $500 an acre. And I did that for years. That's awesome. That's a great return. Yeah. yeah it's a great, it was a great return. And so that's, that's a, a fantastic model is, is to buy, buy large, subdivide into smaller, especially if you focus on those areas where it's just a little bit of paperwork. Mark, for those that want to learn more, you know, learn more about the industry, about you, you know, get access to your podcast or, you know, just follow all the different you know resources that you, that you offer. Where's the best place to track you down? I think the best place to go is the land And, uh, the art of passive income podcast, uh, you've been on many times as well is, is also a great resource, but I'd say if you are really interested in it, uh, get the book dirt rich and for your listeners, I'm going to give you a special link, Kevin. And they can get it for free, just pay shipping, and uh, and see if this is a model that really resonates with them. And they can get that that, that copy on the landgeek.com. That's the best place. Yeah, well, I'm yeah, I'm gonna give you a special link for it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fantastic, yeah. guys. I'll put that in show notes as well. And uh, well, fantastic, Mark. This has been fun, man. I appreciate you coming on. It's always good seeing your face. And uh, yeah. again, let's try not to let it be two years next time that we uh, you know that that, that we gap it between our conversations. So with that, Absolutely. my friend, wish, we are uh, wishing you all the best, and uh, let's talk soon. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate it. All right, guys, that's all we have for this week's show. And so until we meet again next week, this is your host Kevin Bupp wishing you huge success. Take care. Mm -hmm.